Hello ECE 3640 class. I'm going to record some uh, videos to accompany Lab 3 on filtering in C and doing convolution in C. Um, I'm using some new hardware for video recording. I'm doing this in my office instead of at the recording studio, so hopefully this will go well. Here's the outline that we'll follow. Um, we're going to first talk about processing pre-recorded signals and then we'll talk about processing uh, what I'll call real-time signals. This is really just a real-time mode for processing. It's not really doing it in real time. Um, but it's what you would do if you were writing, say, an interrupt service routine to process samples coming from an analog to digital converter. Um, eventually, we'll get to the actual assignment and talk about uh, what is to be done for the assignment. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in for right now. <coughs> So I do want to differentiate between pre-recorded signals and what I'm going to call real-time signals. The, pre the assumption here is that pre-recorded signals um, we can load into memory all at once. There's enough memory available and even if it's a million samples long we're going to be able to load the whole entire signal into, m into memory at one time and process it all at once. We don't have to go back out to disk and read in more samples. It's all, all available. We're going to do the whole thing all at once. Um, it, for real-time signals, the, um, that is not true because the samples that are coming in the future are not available currently. So we have to process the samples as they become available. So that's really the big difference. So let's start by talking about processing pre-recorded signals. And here the focus is on doing performing convolution. <coughs> so here is a small code snippet where we um, create, we uh, statically allocate an array of 1 million short integers. We open a file and read in 1 million short integers into this array, close the file, and then we begin to do the processing. So this just emphasizes that, hey, we can read the whole thing into memory all at once, and we don't have to do more than one F read. Um, so let's assume we have the impulse response. Uh, in, in these examples, I'll use short signals and short impulse responses so we can get a, a hang of what's going on. Um, but let's, So let's suppose the filter has five coefficients, H0 through H4. And let's suppose that that has been stored in memory in time-reversed order. We know that with convolution, um, either the input X or the impulse response H needs to be time-reversed. So in this case, let's just assume that the impulse response is going to be loaded into memory and time reversed. So here you see it's, it, it's in time reversed order because as we move from left to right, we um, go from the tail end of the impulse response to the head end. So H0 is the first sample, and those samples now appear in reverse order in memory. Um, the signal appears in what I would call natural order because as we go from left to right, um, we go from uh, <clears throat> old samples to new samples, or more, more older samples into more recent samples. I don't think we have to do a review of convolution, but um, what is pictured on this page is a, a, a writing out of all possible um, outputs and expressions for what those outputs are in terms of the input. You can see uh, the way I've written it out here that initially the, the um, the filter is empty, and then we fill it with the first sample. So we have x0 times h0. That gives rise to the output at time 0. And then as we move forward in time, you can see <coughs> the succeeding samples of the input signal shifting into the filter. And we're moving them through and doing multiplying and accumulating. And finally, the filter is full by the time we get to uh, y4. So these first four samples are convolution tail. Similarly, at the end, when the filter starts to run out of data, zeros begin to shift in. So we see the last four samples are also convolution tail. It's a little more, more evident when we look at it in this matrix vector format. This table shows uh, the same sort of thing, but um, what I have done is I've laid out the input signal x um, in the second row of the table padded it with zeros on either end. In this case, remember the impulse response is length 5, so I've padded it with four zeros on the front, four zeros on the back. That's for convenience. 
And then um, I have written down the output um, samples uh, above the corresponding input samples. So at time 0, when the input x0 is available, we would produce output y0. Um, we're assuming this is causal processing, so there's no outputs before time 0, and so on. <coughs> Next to each of the inputs and outputs, I have placed the impulse response. And again, you can see that this follows the rules that we've talked about in class. The impulse response is um, in time reversed order, and then the position of the H0 coefficient of the impulse response is positioned next to um, the corresponding input sample. In this case, it's in the first case here, it's positioned next to X0 because we're trying to compute the output at time Y0. Uh, when we want the output at time, y, uh, time 1, we position H0 next to X1, and so on. And so essentially what happens is, for every positioning of the impulse response, we multiply with the samples on the second row of the array. So you can see that's um, zeros, and then x's, and then zeros again. Um, and then here, uh, again, you can, you can see clearly that by the time we get down to this point in time, uh, at time 4, output time 4, the, uh, in the impulse response has shifted into the, the um, it's completely overlapping the input sequence with no parts hanging off uh, either on the front or on the back. And so at time, at time Y4, output Y4 is the first valid, what we might call the valid output. Y5 is valid, 6 is valid, 7 is valid. And then by the time we get to output time 8, the impulse response starts to slide out of the data window. And um, so these would be convolution tail down here. <coughs> so this is, this is how I recommend that we write our program. We, we create an array that is as long as our input signal, n, plus some extra samples on the front and on the back to hold zeros. This will make it much more convenient for uh, writing our convolution routine. So here's a code fragment that illustrates the sort of thing that we want to try. I'm going to let L uh, h be the length of the input signal, Lx be the length of the data, the length of the output is going to be LX plus LH minus 1. But the size of the data array, remember the, the data array <coughs> where we're going to read our input samples into is going to be padded with zeros on the front and the back. So it will have length, uh, be the length of the input signal plus 2 times the length of the impulse response minus 1. And that's what we have here. So LZ. Uh, is what I'm calling um, the length of the input plus two times the length of the impulse response minus one. So I'll, I'll dynamically allocate these um, <coughs> arrays now. So X will be um, an array for holding the input. It's going to be size LZ. The calloc function returns uh, pre-initialized to zero uh, memory space um, for both X and for Y. I'll open up the input file and the output file. Uh, there's some comments here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then really the, uh, I guess one of the key points to note here is this line of code that you see here. I'm doing an F read and I need to read not into uh, the start of the X array. I need to skip over the first LH minus one samples and so I'm doing uh, using pointer arithmetic here to um, give it the starting address of where we want to place the data that fread pulls in. The number of samples that I want to pull in is the length of the input signal, that's LX, and I'm pulling from the FX input data stream coming in from this file. So again, what that's going to do, as shown here in the comment, is instead of reading into the X array um, starting at position 0, we're going to shift over and put our first sample in over here at position LH minus 1. So that skips over. That will leave LH minus 1 zeros in the front. We'll read in our samples, and we'll have LH minus 1 samples in the back. So that's kind of the key to make this whole thing work out. <coughs> the, uh, the benefit gained from doing this is that it makes the convolution loops extremely simple. So the outer loop that you see here loops over every sample of the output. We have to visit each of those once. 
And then for each of the output samples, we have to do a multiply accumulate loop. Okay, so the inner loop loops over the length of the impulse response. And then here, all we do is we multiply the impulse response coefficient times the um, data, the appropriate data samples. And because the impulse response has been loaded in in time reversed order, <coughs> nor normally you would think that for convolution we would need a j and then maybe an i minus j because when we write convolution on paper, we have that sort of a form. But if we if we remember that h is the one that h is the value that's actually being time reversed, um, and it's already in time reversed order, so we can just do uh, the indexing as you see here. I mean, let, let's let's pick a number. Suppose we want the output at time um, three, or maybe let's pick five. The output at time five. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start with impulse response coefficient zero times x of five plus zero, and so that does exactly what we wanted to do. The the impulse the zero impulse response coefficient multiplies the input at the appropriate time. And then as we move from left to right in our array, um, uh, let's see, no, I think I have that backwards. I do have that backwards. Because the zeroth impulse response coefficient is the last one. Anyway, if you go through and uh, take a look at the indexing that's performed here, it implements exactly the uh, structure that is shown here on the this in this table. So take some time, study this, make sure you uh, believe that this actually works. Um, if you imitate this type of processing in your code, uh, the only thing you have to keep in mind is that the impulse response uh, is assumed to be in time reversed order. Other than that, this should work. When we're done with our convolution loop, we write the outputs back out to file, close the files, and we're done. So I have uh, a little C program here that does this sort of processing. Um, I provide, um, it's a little bit more complicated because we have these binary files we have to work with, but essentially um, I have, I print out a little usage message if the user doesn't use this correctly, but I take as command line inputs the name of the input file, which should be a binary file, the name of the output file, which should be a binary file, and the name of the impulse response file, which also should be a binary file. Um, all the rest is as shown in the example code. Um, there's a little bit of error checking here. Uh, you can see here a block of code that performs the time reversing of the impulse response. Other than that, um, here is the main convolution loop and uh, it's just the same as on the previous page. So I'll end the video fragment right here and let you study that um, on your own time.